Hello? Yep, yep, yep. Hi, uh, my name is Nob, and I am the Japanese pastor Hayden was talking about, and uh, I'll try my best to preach in English. <laughs> and thank you for the invitation again. It's great to be with you this morning, and uh, it's a privilege that I get to share the Word of God with you. But before I start, I, let me pray. Dear God, thank you that you are here in, with us in this morning. Some of us might be feeling tired or distressed or even hopeless, but open our hearts, open our ears so that we can receive the living word from you, O Lord. Help me to speak well and use me, although I am weak and insufficient and inadequate, but your grace is always sufficient, O Lord. So please pour your grace abundantly. I pray those things in your name. Amen. So, uh, we have been following the series of Advent, remembering and celebrating the arrival of this special baby, Jesus. This baby is special. Not only because he's a long-awaited Messiah, but he is actually the Almighty God who chose to come to us in human flesh, which just blows our mind. And yet, for a first century Jew, it was even more crazy idea. For them, it was impossible that the one true God to actually be born as a baby and become one of us. Today, we are going to look at an event in which the disciple experienced this amazement and even fear because they suddenly realized that their rabbi is divine. That this Jesus they follow is not just a, another rabbi, he's, but he is actually God. So please turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 22 to 25. Luke chapter 8. To verse 22 to 25. We got the word on the screen as well. So it says, One day he got in a boat, into a boat with his disciple, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and, they sailed, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with the water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And, and he w awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And, there, and they were afraid, and they were marveled, saying no to one another, Who is this that, that he commands even with winds and water, and they obey him? Now, how many of you have read this passage before? Yes, yes. So for those of us who have been around for a church for a while, it is one of the familiar story, isn't it? And even if this was your first time reading it, it's, the story is simple and easy to follow. Anybody can understand, right? I mean, Jesus and disciple gets on the boat and try to go across the lake, but the storm comes and the boat starts sinking, so the disciple cries out to Jesus, and Jesus commands the storm, and boom, there is a calm and everybody is saved. That's the story. Nothing is complicated. And the message of this particular passage also seems to be clear. You know, Jesus comes storm of the lake, so therefore he can come storm of your life. So do not lose heart, but have a strong faith even in your trials. I'm sure you must have heard the sermon along those lines from this text. I mean, I have heard the sermon like that. But as I prepared for this message, what I learned is that the main point of this passage is not actually neither about our face nor about the storm, but about who Jesus is. We get this because at the very end, the disciple says, who then is this? Which, which is the response to Jesus calming the storm? So this, so this just event just happened, re revealed something about who Jesus is. Sure, we can learn the importance of having the strong faith in our trials, and that is definitely a strong application. But what the Luke, the writer, trying to communicate first and foremost through this passage is who Jesus is, the identity of Christ. So we will talk about faith and the storm, but before that, our first question has to be, who is this Jesus that just calmed the storm? So let's go to verse 25 one more time. Um, 
Yes. <laughs> so he did, said, said to them, Where is your face? And they were afraid. Notice after the wind and waves dies down, it doesn't say disciples were at peace or relieved, but they, it says they were afraid. Why? I mean, the storm is gone and the water is calm now, so there is nothing to worry about, and their lives are no longer in danger, but they were afraid. Why are they afraid? I mean, what are they afraid of? The answer is simple. They were afraid of Jesus just calming the storm. You know, the miracle. They saw the miracle. To, to which I was like, yeah, but this wasn't their first time seeing his supernatural power, right? I mean, haven't they already seen him healing the sick and casting out the demons and all things, things like that? But this was different. The calming the storm was totally another level. Especially in Jewish mind, it was a strong, I mean, very profound action. Because in the Old Testament, it was always God who had power over the nature. Nobody else did. So the general Old Testament context is this. God, not a man, uh, controls the nature. Especially having dominion over water and the sea, which were seen as a symbol of uh, chaos and evil, was the God's thing. Nobody else had that. I mean, we can look at so many passages, but we don't have time, so here is some list. You can probably take a photo and check them out later. Um, we're going to see one from one, uh, Psalm 107, verse 28 to 30. It says, Then cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from the, their distress. He made the storm be still, and the wave of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the water were quiet, and he brought them to their desired haven. It's interesting because it almost sounds like talking about today's passage, but notice it says it is the Lord who made the storm be still and the waves of the sea hushed. Only God controls the water. Only the Yahweh commands the storm. And Jesus just did that. The only logical conclusion in disciples' mind is, wait, he is God? To which some of us be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about Moses? You know, didn't he also part the sea, the water kind of related miracles? Well, technically, it wasn't M Moses but God who separated the sea. That is why he had to pray to God. As a result, the sea split into half. But notice how Jesus calms the storm. Does he pray? No, he just rebukes it. In the parallel passage found in the Marcus Gospel, uh, Mark chapter 4, 39 says, uh, Jesus said to the sea, be, uh, peace be still. Which in original Greek, it's more like, shut up. <laughs> Stay shut up. Just a few words and waves and winds and storms obey him. Whoa. Of course they get afraid. Because they were like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We knew our rabbi is a kind of special, but... And even be Messiah, but he's way more than that. He is divine. He is, he is God. So the first point we should get this from uh, this passage is Jesus is God. Thank you. Now to which some of us be like, well, I knew that. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor, but give me something I don't know. You know, I mean, of course Jesus is God. I mean, that's what the Christian faith is all about, to believe Jesus is God. So the first, uh, the second question I want to ask ourselves is this. So then, what is faith? What does it mean to have faith in the storm? I mean, disciples must have had some kind of faith because they weren't amateurs, you know? Some of them are professional fishermen, so they knew uh, this, the, the Sea of Galilee is a place of storm. So this lake is, uh, is actually 200 meters below sea level, so it sits like in a deep valley, and there are these high mountains around it. And from these high mountains, the cool air comes down and meets the warm air on the lake, and that can create the bad sudden storm. So they knew all that. And notice in verse 22, it, uh, we see it was actually Jesus who said, let us go across to the sea, other side of the lake. It was his idea to go on the boat. And Jesus obeys his words, knowing that all oh, the risks of the storm. If Jesus said so, we will go. 
you know, they were obedient to uh, his words. Nevertheless, the storm hits and the boat is filling up the water and they started to think, wait, 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 wait. This is worse than, the, worse than we c- thought we could be. We could actually die here. That's how bad it was. So they looked at Jesus because it, after all, it was his idea. So I don't know, maybe in their minds, but it was like, it was your idea. You have to take care of us. That's your responsibility. That, mind of, that kind of thought might have been in their mind. But what they saw was Jesus sleeping. Jesus was sleeping in the, uh, in the storm, verse 24. So they went and woke him saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. In fear, they cry out to Jesus while he was asleep on the boat in the storm. Now here, the contrast between the disciple and G- Jesus is often pointed out. The lesson we are supposed to learn from here is something like this. Don't be like those disciples, meaning don't be afraid or have fear in any circumstances, but be like this Jesus who can sleep even through the storm. So the disciples' fear is interpreted as the sign of lack of faith, where Jesus sleeping is seen as as him being at peace and calm and trusting the Father. And if he can be at peace, we should also at be at peace in the matter of our distress. And that's the kind of faith we are supposed to have in the storm. Or is it? Moreover, Jesus' rebuke of his disciple in verse 25 also encourages us that way. Right? Where is your faith? In the Gospel of Mark's parallel passage, Jesus' words are more, even more harsh. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? If so, if so. Having strong faith means you don't feel fear at all in any circumstances, but be able to sleep in the kind of storm that can kill you, you know, be like Jesus. Is that what we're supposed to learn here? Is that the kind of faith we are supposed to have in the storm? I don't know. I don't know. Yes, disciples were rebuked for not having the enough faith. But what did they fail to believe? What were they supposed to believe? Were they supposed to believe that they are going to survive? That they are not going to die? Because after all, Jesus is the one who said in verse 22, we are going across over the lake, not under. You know? Maybe they were supposed to believe his words no matter what happens. Maybe. But to be honest, I find it hard to apply, apply this to my life because I don't have that kind of specific promise or words when it comes to my life. You know, we get going across over. For example, when you get sick, I can't find the words of Jesus says, you're going to be healed, you will not die. Or... When I have trouble at work, I can't find of Jesus who says, God will fix this. Everything will be all right. Nothing like that in the Bible. In fact, sometimes you don't get healed and will will eventually all die. And sometimes you do get fired and the problems won't resolve in the way always you desire. Sometimes the storm can kill us, and that's life, isn't it? So then, the kind of faith we are supposed to have, the things we are supposed to believe in the storm, is not that the boat will never sink and everything will be fine in the end, because Jesus never ever promised us that kind of life. In fact, if you walk the way of faith long enough, you cannot avoid suffering, you cannot avoid trials, you cannot avoid the storm, and sometimes sometimes they destroy us, right? So what should we do when we face the storm? That's the question. What does the faith we are supposed to have in the storm in our life look like? I mean, for disciples, what would be an appropriate response? What could they have done differently? I mean, would it have been better if they were all at sleep, like Jesus, while the boat was covering the storm, I mean, the water? You know, t- totally trusting that this boat will never sink. 
then what would have happened? I think they would have drowned then, you know, because everybody is asleep pretty much. Or maybe just don't wake up Jesus, but work hard on your own uh, uh, power to just save the boat because they are professional fishermen. Would that have worked better? Well, I don't think so. They, ha- they would have died as well. So then, in a sense, they, the disciple had no choice but to wake up Jesus and ask for help. That was the only way. And that's also the same in our life, isn't it? Because when we face trouble or trials, you can't just sit and do nothing or sleep and do nothing, expecting God will fix this and, you know, and everything will be fine. Because then I think everything wouldn't go well, right? Or if you work hard and try to fix the problem on your own strengths, that's not a good idea either. That's not faith at all. We as Christians are called to pray to God and ask Him for help when we are in trouble. So then, being desperate and crying out to Jesus does not mean you lack faith. But actually, it can be an act of faith. Because we have faith, we cry out and ask for help. When we experience the storm of our life, whether it be a severe illness, unexpected tragedy, divorce, financial crisis, cancer, whatever, we will feel fear. We will feel anxiety. And it's okay. It's okay. It's normal. I mean, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was troubled and distressed says Mark 14, 33. If you're human, you will feel those things. But the point is, whether we could cry out to God in our faith, whether we could ask help to God in faith, that's what the faith in the storm should look like. Well, if that is the case, why did Jesus rebuke the disciples? Where is your faith? What did they do wrong? I mean, you know, they too cry out to Jesus for help, didn't they? Well, not quite. Their exact words were, Master, Master, we are perishing. And it almost sounds like, Master, can't you see we are dying here? What are you doing? Do something. And uh, Mark's Gospel's parallel passage, uh, Jesus' words has different sort of tone. Mark 4, 38, it says, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care? (laughs) What the disciple failed to believe was not his power or ability to save them, but Jesus' heart, Jesus' love. They doubted his heart, his character, his goodness. Don't you care? It's like, Jesus, I know you can do something about it, but if you're not doing anything, that means you do not care about us. I don't know about you, but I have felt like that in my life before. I get this in my life. I, uh, I used to have had this uh, neuralgia, uh, nerve pain from my uh, lower back to my right leg. I still have it a bit. Uh, it started eight years ago when I was in Japan. Thank God it's, it's much better now. But it was definitely one of the worst storms I have experienced in my life. It, it just started as just the ordinal pain. I thought it was going to go away in a couple of days, but uh, I thought I worked too hard or something. But after three months, I was still in, uh, still in pain. So I went to go to doctor to get checked. But they, they could find out they couldn't find out what was wrong with me. So I went to bigger hospital, and I did the MRI, CT scan, blood test, you name it, everything. But they couldn't find anything wrong with my body, which meant there was nothing they could do. But the pain was real to me. And having this pain for 24-7 was very difficult. Because of this unceasing pain, I got really uh, emotionally unstable, easy to be irritated, all the time. Sleeping was the only time I could escape from this pain. I couldn't sit for a long time. I couldn't drive for a long time. It was very difficult. I went to all sorts of doctors and physios and any kind of treatment, but this pain wasn't going away. Did I pray? 
Sure, you bet I did. Please heal me, God. Please heal me for many, many times. I wondered, will my body always be like this for the rest of my life? Fear and anxiety was filling up my heart. After two years, I gave up. Thinking, well, there is no point praying. Because it doesn't matter how hard I pray. God won't heal me. It's not like God cannot heal me. But he chose not to, I thought. That's his will. And if, if that is the case, what is the point of having faith? What is the point of believing the kind of God who seems to be silent in my greatest needs? He does not care. That's exactly how I felt. I couldn't pray for a while. How about you? Have you felt like that before? I mean, as Christians, when we face the storm in our life, we will pray and we will ask God to save us. But what if God seems to be silent? No response to your prayer for a long time. Then you'll get tired. You get tired hoping and expecting, maybe this time God will heal me. Maybe this time God will answer my prayer. Maybe this time, maybe, then nothing happens. So you give up. Not in the sense of surrendering everything into His hand in trust, but you give up expecting anything from him altogether. And that way, at least you don't have to get disappointed. But in that process, you will lose something crucial to the relationship between you and God, namely love. And it gets cold. Now that is something Jesus rebukes. Why did you doubt my heart? Where is your faith? Disciples said to Uh, Jesus, don't you care? And Jesus' answer is, of course I care. Of course I care. Because Jesus is in the same boat with disciple, which means if they are going down, he will go down and he will die too. His life is at stake. So of course he cares for his disciple as if they are on his life. He cares. Now, to which some of you some of us, or oh, I'll be like, well, that's nice that they got Jesus in their boat. But what about me? When I look around, I see no Jesus with me. Sure, he, can, he might be in my heart, in his spirit or something, but I cannot feel it. Rather, I feel like I'm alone and drowning alone. If you feel like that, if you are feeling like that, On what basis can we trust his heart? On what basis can I believe he actually cares about me? The answer is found here, the cross. It's the cross. It's the cross. When I look at the cross, I can be sure about his heart. Romans 5, 8 says, But God showed his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. I mean, what is the biggest storm we will experience in our life? Everybody experienced this. It's the death. It's the death. So through the cross, Jesus gets into the boat with us in the middle of this ultimate storm of sin and death. He is the kind of God who is not only willing to share our faith, saying, if you sink, I will sink too, but he's also willing to sacrifice his life so that we can be rescued from this ultimate storm of sin and death. The reason why he went to die, he went to cross and died for you and me, is because he cares. The reason why he came to this world as a baby is because he cares and if and he is in the same boat and if he didn't abandon us in the ultimate storm on the cross he would not ever leave us alone in any other storms now jesus has another name which you might have heard in the christmas story and that's emmanuel emmanuel and that means god 
with us. So he is with us, even in the storm. We need to trust not only his power, but on this base, on this base, we trust his heart as well. Now, the last question I want to ask ourselves is this. So then, what does the storm do to us? What does the storm bring to us? I mean, what did the disciple learn through the storm? You remember? We covered that in the first point, you know? After the storm is gone, who then is this? They learned that Jesus is God. I mean, they had seen his miracles. They had heard his teaching. But it was only when their lives were in danger they learned Jesus is God. And maybe that is also the case with our, the storm of our lives as well. Because when we face the storm, the trials in our life, often the foundation of our lives gets shaken. Whether it be a losing job, losing loved ones, divorce, cancer, financial crisis, whatever. Through these storms, we learn that we are actually uh, weaker than we thought. We learn actually we are standing on the fragile grounds, namely I don't know, career, money, health, family, relationship, everything. And as they have been shaken by the storm of trials, we learn we cannot across this long voyage called life. We come to the end of our service and cry out to Jesus, help, save us. And as Jesus calms the storm, whatever the storm we are going through, we come to know that He is God. He is God. Not in our heads, but in our heart. I knew He is God, but now I know He is God. Maybe we can't see that when we are in the storm, but after the storm is gone, we could probably say, now I can see He cared for me. Now I can see he was indeed control, in control, and he used everything for good. Maybe some of you are going through the terrible, awful storm right now, wondering, why do I have to go through this? Where is God? Does he even care? Does he even care? But may you come to see he is on board with you in the same boat. Because he is Emmanuel. He's the kind of God who is willing to come to this world as a baby just to be with us. And may you look up on the cross and be reminded that he died for you so that we can be rescued from the ultimate storm of sin and death. Therefore, therefore, he will never, ever leave you alone. He is with us. He cares about us. We will show sure, feel the fear and anxiety in our storm. But may you cry out to Jesus, not only because you trust the power of Jesus, but you trust his heart as well. And as we experience his goodness and grace and love in the storm, through the storm, our faith will grow and eventually we will be able to say, from the bottom of my hearts, Jesus is my God. Because the storm revealed who he really is. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you that you are with us no matter what is going on around us. Lord, we are weak, so when we experience the storm, we think you, you don't care. But you do care, of course. Help us to be reminded the kind of love that you showed on the cross, Lord. Help, you, help, help us to trust uh, through this storm, whatever the storm we experience. I pray those things in your name. Amen.